afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our session today. We are live again with our part two of Amazon Redshift session. We had a wonderful session in the month of May uh, by Rajas, and we got a good feedback, good comments about the session. And we are back with our second episode of Amazon Redshift with some more advanced concepts. How do you take Redshift when it comes to production? What are the best practice, performance tuning, and those kinds of stuff? So please be seated, hold your breath. We are just a few minutes away to start with the session. Let me quickly talk about what do we have for today's session, right? So first, uh, let me before we start around with our session today, let me talk about what is AWS User Group, why you should join AWS User Group, right? It's a platform or medium which help you to interact with the networks, with the experts out. We do have different folks, uh, the experts, the different AWS heroes, ambassadors, uh, the AWS experts as a part of the group. We, they share their knowledge, their different blogs, learning, their expertise from industries. They access, you get an access to different contents, right? The AWS updates what you get on different services, the different blogs, the different kinds of demonstration, what's there. So those all materials, what you get, which you help you to learn and adapt the different things going on in AWS. There are different offline events that takes place. If you talk about there are different user groups which do offline events in terms of who's writing maximum certifications, who's writing maximum number of blogs, who's the maximum influencer, those kinds of different events they have. There are different interesting events like as we have today. There is one more tomorrow what we have in the morning as well as in the afternoon. Interesting events that take place by different user groups across the India. Last but not the least, you have rewards and recognitions for different participations across these events. So that's why it's very important that you join. Most of in India, if I talk about all user groups are available to a nearby locality. So please do join. If you find any difficult, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. Let me know. I'll help you to find out your nearby uh, user group, which will help you to scale, grow, and learn, and, exp and have a net best networking experts with experts. So that's why it's very important to join about AWS user group. When it comes to Mumbai, for all the folks who are nearby locality of Mumbai in suburbs or nearby area, please do join and subscribe AWS user group Mumbai. We are available in all sorts of social media platform. If I talk about majorly, we leverage Slack for our interaction, but we are also available on LinkedIn. Twitter, Insta, and Meetup, any sorts of events, what we do, you will see all sorts of calendar available in Meetup, as well as if you need to get some more idea, more understanding, more technical help, do Slack. I've always been active. My other peers have been active, will be ready to help you out in any sorts of stuff. Even if you want to be one of the speaker for AWS User Group Mumbai, we are looking out for more speakers. Please do join our Slack and reach out to any of our co-organizers. We'll be happy to host you. So that's about... Uh, AWS User Group Mumbai. Coming about today's session, we have Rajas. Uh, the speaker is the same from our last session. I don't have to introduce, but let me talk about Rajas. Uh, he's an associate solution architect at Quantify INC. Uh, he's an AWS community builder, as well as an expert when it comes to analytics. He has written multiple different blogs on mediums. Recently, he also published an APN blog talking about his skills around data analytics. So we are very happy to get Rajas. Let me get Rajas on the stage. Hi Rajas, how are you doing today? Hey, Sanchit, I'm good. How are you? Doing good. Thank you for accepting our invite for the second time for this month and helping us to learn about Redshift. I know I've been working in out with you, so I know what, you're the best when it comes to Redshift and data analytics on AWS. So I really sure. appreciate that you spend out your time on this busy schedule and helping us to learn about Redshift. So with that, let me pass on the control to Rajas so he can go ahead, uh, talk about today's session, the agenda. And what do we get around it? Again, please don't drop the session in the middle. We'll try to keep this more interesting. So if you have any questions, queries, please put it in the chat. Rajas and I'll take it up and we'll answer those questions. As well as I do have surprises. For all the folks who are there constantly been attending this session, till end, we'll have a quiz. An interesting quiz and all three winners will get AWS credits. So hold your bells, pass on your seat bells, and I'll pass on the control to Rajas. Rajas, over to you. Thank you, Sanchit. Yep. So uh, let's start with the today's session. Before I start, actually, Sanchit has given a brief introduction of myself. Uh, basically, this slide talks about uh, what are my expertise. So I'll just uh, cover it in a few minutes. Uh, basically, I have experience and expertise in around data analytics services on AWS, uh, majorly working around big data tools, data lake, warehousing, and different types of BI intelligent tools and dashboarding. I've also linked my LinkedIn and Medium profiles, so you can go and check out the different blogs that I've published around data analytics and AWS services. 
uh, that will help you to uh, gain more understanding about different AWS services. So uh, let's deep dive into our today's session. So this is the high level agenda that we have for today's session. And as Sanchit mentioned that we already had a session one about Redshift, which was more around introduction and overview of Redshift. And today's session is going to be um, diving deep into different types of features and important concepts about Amazon Redshift. So let me just cover the different agenda pointers over here. So we'll start with what are different distribution keys and sort keys on Redshift. What is the significance of those and what are the different types and their use cases. Then we'll understand what is Redshift serverless. Uh, moving on to Redshift Spectrum, understanding what is Redshift Spectrum, its integration with Glue Data Catalog, and what are the different use cases around Redshift Spectrum. Then we'll quickly have a good hands-on session, which generally covers how to create Spectrum tables, query those tables, and kind of join it with the local tables and kind of create materialized views around those. And then we'll also talk about two important Redshift features, which is concurrency scaling and workload management, along with an example for that. So let me just get into the first part of our session today. That is about distribution keys and sort keys. So let's first understand what is a distribution key and what are sort keys. Okay. So uh, distribution keys and sort keys are kind of um, uh, tools which are used by Amazon Redshift to kind of improve the query performance. Now, uh, if you see the architecture of Amazon Redshift, uh, as we discussed in our last uh, last session, it's a columnar database, right? It's a columnar database where compression happens on the columns and there is a cluster that is created. So a cluster will have a leader node and there are multiple compute nodes around it, right? And if you compare it with the traditional databases like MySQL and Postgres, generally a query optimization are done by using different types of indexes and bucketings, right? So similar to that, what we have in Redshift are distribution keys and sort keys. Now, what is a distribution key? Basically, distribution key will help you to define which particular column in your table is going to be used to distribute the data of that particular table. So if I if you if if we understand the architecture of Redshift, right, there are different compute nodes. So whenever you create a table and load the data into that table, the table is not going to sit in just one node. It's going to be distributed across all the nodes. Now, how do you define how the distribution of the data should happen? And that is something that is related to the distribution keys. So let's let's understand what are the significance of using distribution keys. Basically, distribution key determines how your data will be stored in a Redshift cluster. So how the data is distributed across different nodes, that is something that is dependent upon the distribution key that you select for that table. Then as I mentioned that it's heavily dependent on the query performance. So uh, let's say if your table is stored only in one of the cluster, then what happens? So automatically the entire processing of the data only happens in a single uh, node rather than uh, using the power of parallel processing. So Redshift itself is built on the uh, concept of massive parallel processing, right? So if you have your data stored only in one particular node, that is a very bad way of storing the data and that will give you a very uh, bad performance of any type of joining queries or aggregation or in complex calculation. Then uh, what are sort keys? So sort keys are basically the keys used to actually sort the data for that particular partition in a particular node. So whenever your data is partitioned across different nodes, uh, the records in that particular partition, how to store those records and how to sort those records depend upon the selection of a sort key. So automatically, if you define a proper sort keys, which are generally used in your joining conditions or in your filters, automatically the query performance increases. And as I mentioned that uh, distribution keys and sort keys uh, are used by the leader node whenever it has to create a query execution plan for any query that you have submitted to the cluster. So depending upon the metadata information of your tables and the disk keys and the sort keys, the query execution plan will be designed so that the maximum optimized performance is obtained for that particular query execution. Now let's understand what are the different types of distribution styles on Redshift. Okay. So there are in total four different distribution styles. The first one is a key distribution style. So as the name suggests, basically the distribution key that you define for the table is something that is leveraged by the Redshift cluster to distribute the data. So uh, what happens is that, let's say you have a table that you create and you define a distribution key on a particular column. So depending upon the values 
in that particular column, your data will be distributed across different nodes that you have on the cluster. Now, you might have a question like, how do we decide which particular column should be chosen for a distribution? Key? So there are two important uh, pointers whenever you want to choose a distribution key. The first one is that you will have to check whether the column that you're choosing as a distribution key is a properly, uh, the records of for that particular for that particular column is properly distributed across all the unique values that you have in that particular column. So let's say if you have a 10 unique values in that particular column and one of the unique values have around 40% of the records of your entire table, then that's a not, then that's not a good distribution key. because what will happen is that all the 40% of the records for that table will actually go into a single node and that will create data skewness problem in the entire cluster. And the second most important thing that you want to keep in mind when you choose a distribution key is that your column should have highest cardinality. Now, when I say highest cardinality value, it means that your column should have more number of unique values rather than less number of unique values. So automatically, when you have more number of unique values in that column, uh, there will be more number of partitions uh, which will be created for a single table rather than having less number of partitions. So automatically, when you have more number of partition, the data is segregated across the cluster in a much more better way rather than going it into a single node. So that those are the two important parts that you should keep in mind whenever you're choosing a key distribution style. Now then there is a question like which particular, uh, for which particular tables you'll be using key distribution style. So generally we prefer using key distribution style for those tables which are heavily used in your joining queries. So if you have a very huge table such as fact tables or dimension tables, this is these are the tables which are most of the times going to be used in your joining condition. So generally key distribution style is preferred for such type of tables. Okay, let's move on to the next distribution style, which is an even distribution style. So if you see, it's a very simple kind of a distribution style where the records in your table are um, stored in each and every partition in a round robin fashion. So when I say round robin, what happens is that the first record goes into the first slice, second record, record goes to the second slice, third record goes to third slice, and fourth record goes to fourth slice. Again, the fifth record goes to the first slice. So there is a round robin that happens, and without any uh, any condition checked in the behind, automatically one after the other, the records will be inserted into different different partitions. So now you might have a question like, where do we use even distribution style? So generally, even distribution styles are something which are used when you do not have uh, the tables uh, in your joining conditions. So the tables which are not going to be joined with any other tables, those kind of tables generally are uh, created using even distribution style. So just to give you an example, like uh, in a warehousing concept, you have data marks, right? So data marks are what? What the data marks are basically the final aggregated tables that you generally create uh, to uh, for your reporting needs or for your BI tools, right? So when you, whenever you create a data mart, the calculation and the uh, joining and everything is happening before the creation of data marts. Once you create a data mart table, you ideally do not join it with any other table, right? So those type of tables are something that you can create using even distribution style. The next distribution style that we have is basically all distribution style. Now, as the name suggests that all distribution style is going to be used when your table has to be replicated across all the nodes. So what happens is that uh, you have a table that you create and you define all distribution style. Then the entire data or the copy of that table is basically stored in each and every node of the uh, Redshift cluster. Now, um, if you think on this particular lines, it, it's a very high storage requirement, right? So because the same table is copied across each and every node. So generally, you prefer using all distribution style for those tables which are smaller in size rather than going with larger tables. Because if you have a larger table and you store the same copy of that table across all the nodes, then it's going to use a lot of storage uh, disks on the uh, Redshift cluster. So to avoid that happening, you should always use a smaller table whenever you're choosing an all distribution style. And uh, Another example that I would like to give you over here is that if you are aware of the Spark concept, so in Spark, you have a broadcast join, right? Now, what is a broadcast join? So whenever you are joining a larger table with a smaller table, 
then spark will automatically determine that it that one table is a smaller table and it will broadcast that table across all the nodes in the cluster now what optimization does it uh, occur in the spark performance like whenever you have a smaller table which is already present in the node so automatically the shuffling of the data for that smaller table is avoided completely because and all the data for that smaller table is already available in each and every executor of that spark cluster so automatically your join performs much more better in the same way whenever you have a smaller table on redshift and generally you are using those tables for multiple joins that is where you are going to use an all distribution style so let me give you an example for all distribution style so you have a, a mapping file okay let's say you have a mapping file which has the country name and the isd code for that country name now if you think this particular mapping file is going to be very small in size of course there won't be huge number of records so automatically if you use or create this table then you are going to use an all distribution style because that is how your query performance will improve whenever you are joining on this particular mapping file and one more important thing that you should keep in mind is that generally tables which are very less frequently updated and less frequently loaded or deleted such type of tables you should create using all distribution style because if you think logically if you have the same copy of the table maintained across each and every node and you upgrade and you fire an update query or you reload the data then automatically redshift has to update each and every copy of that same table which is present across all the nodes so it's an overhead for the redshift cluster to actually do that so generally which are frequent which are not frequently updated and which are uh, very small in size those kind of tables we generally use with the all distribution style and the last one is the most simplest and uh, the very default a distribution style that you have on redshift which is an auto distribution style so it as the name suggests it's an auto distribution style where amazon redshift will define which particular distribution style it should select for that particular table so it's a default uh, distribution style for redshift tables it means that whenever you create a table without defining the distribution style for that table then it is generally an automatic distribution style so redshift will define depending upon your query patterns as well as depending upon your history of the data and the size of data it will decide which type of distribution style suits for that particular table so if you are not aware of these concepts and if you are creating a simple table on redshift then it's automatically an auto distribution style that redshift will take care of the distribution keys and everything so that is how you actually use different distribution keys and distribution style to actually relocate the data across the uh nodes which you have in cluster okay now let's uh, get into the details of what is redshift serverless and redshift spectrum let's first talk about redshift serverless so uh, let me tell you that redshift serverless is one of the most uh, important and it's a very new feature that amazon has recently published so basically uh, if you understand the name it's basically a serverless version of your redshift now uh, if you remember the architecture of redshift redshift is a cluster based service right you have leader nodes you come and have compute nodes where you basically create the cluster create the configuration decide upon the memory and cpus and accordingly the cluster is deployed but in serverless you basically do not have to select what is going to be the cpu what is going to be the memory and what is the storage requirement for your redshift data automatically everything will be handled by aws in the backend now what is the need for using serverless or for, why did amazon came up with this entire serverless feature okay now if you see the generally most of the customers that we have also seen are more focused on their business use case and to get most out of the data and analytics or the data that is they have on the data warehouse right so that is where this entire concept comes into play where for those customers who are majorly focused upon uh, their business use case getting the reports and bi tools output that is where the customers are not majorly focused upon the overhead of managing the cluster defining the configuration and all and that's where you are going to go ahead with the redshift serverless so it's a it's a very different kind of a thing that amazon has come up with which actually is very different from the traditional way how we create a data warehouse and define the storage and everything so here automatically everything will be taken care by amazon itself let's look at some of the features on uh, redshift serverless 
so there is basically as i mentioned that there is no need to set up and create and deploy clusters all the clusters and the configuration will be managed by aws in the packet now let's understand how is the pay or pricing for redshift serverless okay so redshift serverless is going to cost you only for the time for which you are running a query on the cluster so let's say if you are creating a table then you fire a query if you are loading the data then you fire a query if you select a if you fire a select query then automatically you are querying the data so for only these activities the pricing of the redshift serverless will be incurring otherwise if you uh, create some tables and just keep it as it is on the redshift serverless instance without using it for a month or so then you won't be incurring any charges for it so that's the beauty of it like you actually are paying only for the compute and for which you are using the data or querying the data that's a major difference with the redshift serverless and the uh, server based redshift because in server based redshift if you are not uh, querying the data and just the redshift cluster is in the running state then you are incurring the charges even if your cpu utilization is zero but you have to pay the charge for which the cluster is running okay um, then as i mentioned that it's it's majorly for those users who are focused on their data and analytics need and rather than not want to go into the intricacies of managing the cluster and everything and the best part of it is that you have to just load the data and you can start querying the data without worrying about uh, deploying the cluster understanding the concurrency limit of it or understanding how much load the redshift cluster can take and those kind of details so it's completely serverless and that's the the beauty of redshift that they have actually included as in very new feature in uh, previous few months now let's understand what is redshift spectrum okay so redshift spectrum is a very very interesting topic basically and uh, what what does this feature give you actually so redshift spectrum gives you the feature where you can actually uh, create uh, external tables for the data which is residing on amazon s3 buckets okay so let's say if you have a data on s3 and if you want to query that data then rather than loading the data into a redshift cluster you can directly query the data uh, by creating external tables so it automatically means that you are eliminating the 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 oh, workload of actually creating the etl pipeline to load the data from s3 to redshift basically it, it's saving your time as well as saving your effort and money to actually create those pipelines uh, load the data into redshift and then query but you can directly query the data in its raw format which is present on the s3 bucket that's the beauty of redshift spectrum couple of features that we have on redshift spectrum is basically it provides you with a scalable uh, architecture and there is no manual intervention that you have to do whenever you are creating a spectrum table or querying the spectrum table i'll talk about this particular feature in the next slide where we have the uh, architecture of spectrum uh, where you'll understand why it is why it's going to be scalable and without any manual effort that is required now the pricing of redshift spectrum is again the paper pricing model that it provides you basically you create a spectrum table and the pricing will be incurred only for the data that you are querying from s3 so whenever you fire a query on redshift spectrum only then you will be incurring cost otherwise there is no cost associated with the spectrum tables and then as i mentioned that there is no etl that is required to actually uh, load the data into redshift and you are actually querying the data just when it's raw format there is a high concurrency that you can achieve with redshift spectrum because if you think through it basically your data is already present on s3 right so there can be other applications who can actually consume the data from the s3 bucket so that's where uh, your other applications as well as other redshift clusters can also concurrently access the data which is present on s3 and if you are updating data on s3 then again there is no need to actually load the updated data back to redshift because we are not loading data to redshift we are just pointing an external table to that s3 location and querying the data directly from s3 so that's a very beautiful thing that you get with redshift spectrum now let's understand uh, the architecture of redshift spectrum okay what what is the difference between the original architecture that we had with redshift cluster and what is the addition if we see the spectrum over here so if you see the yellow part that we have basically the leader node and the compute node this this entire thing is something which is very common to your redshift cluster right if you uh, uh, 
uh, if the the previous session that we did we actually discussed about the leader node the compute nodes what are the actually uh, functions of leader node and compute node and uh, how does the communication happen between different client applications and with the compute nodes okay but if you see the addition that we have over uh, in this entire redshift spectrum architecture is that these green nodes that you see over here which are nothing but the spectrum nodes okay now these spectrum nodes are something which are automatically created in the backend and as a developer you do not have to configure or deploy these nodes so whenever you create an external table or a spectrum table on redshift automatically there is a layer of redshift spectrum node that is added within your cluster and that is something that you do not have to manage as well as configure those so that's the reason uh, the previous feature that we had right the scalability it's automatically scalable if you are querying the data with huge volume on s3 the spectrum nodes will automatically scale itself so you do not have to worry about managing those spectrum nodes as well as deciding the scalability of it that's the that is how your spectrum nodes can automatically scale okay now uh, let's understand what happens whenever a query is or a spectrum query is actually fired on the redshift cluster so the spectrum query is of course going to be submitted to the leader node right now leader node will actually create a query execution plan and it will basically assign different tasks to the compute nodes as well as to the red spectrum nodes okay now whenever there are filters and everything applied in that uh, spectrum query your filters your aggregation and all the projections are something that are pushed down towards the spectrum nodes rather than doing it on the compute node layer for of the redshift so what happens is that uh, your data is residing on s3 right so the data is pulled from the s3 buckets within your spectrum nodes the calculation the joining and the aggregation is something that is done by spectrum nodes itself and the intermediate output that obtained from the spectrum nodes is something that is pushed back to the compute nodes the compute nodes will uh, perform their operations on the intermediate result and accordingly they will send back the final result to the leader node and leader node will actually give back the final output to your client application so that that's the way where the query execution for the spectrum queries happen so most of the calculation and uh, execution of the spectrum table are generally performed by the spectrum nodes only the calculation and the joining that is required for the tables which are created locally in the redshift cluster are done by the compute node so that is how the segregation of the tasks happen whenever you are using spectrum tables now there is an interesting thing that we need to understand over here so if you see there is a glue data catalog that we have in this architecture okay now first of all let me explain you what is a glue data catalog so glue data catalog is basically a, an aws service where it provides you a centralized repository for all the metadata that you create that you can create and store for all the tables and databases that you have in your aws uh, platform so what happens is that whenever you have data residing on s3 now to get the schema of that particular uh, s3 data you need to create a glue data catalog for that particular data which is present on s3 and spectrum nodes are actually taking the metadata information from the glue data catalog just to understand what is the schema of the data on s3 and according to that they are performing the operations so there is an important part where um, glue data catalog is going to play in this entire architecture and of course in the hands on session we'll understand what that operation is how do we actually create the glue data catalog and uh, how does this entire spectrum tables are and, and everything created okay uh, just to give you an analogy of the glue data catalog if you are aware of hive basically hive metastore is nothing but it's a kind of a metadata repository for all the hive external tables right similar to that it's very similar that glue data catalog works in the same way so you create external tables which for the data which is present on s3 and all the metadata information will be stored in your glue data catalog okay and let me just cover a, a very important part about the costing of spectrum queries okay so as i mentioned in the previous it's a paper pricing kind of a model right so it will cost you only for the uh, amount of data that you are actually extracting from your s3 bucket so if you uh, have a data set and if you are querying the data uh, using the spectrum table and the amount of data that is extracted from s3 is around 1 tb then you are actually incurring a cost of $5 so 1 tb of data extraction will cost you $5 that's the 
pricing of spectrum and the beauty of it is that let's say if your data is small but the operation that you're performing on the data is very complex so automatically you are not incurring the cost for the complexity of the processing or for the cpu that is assigned you are actually only incurring the cost for the amount of data that you are extracting from s3 so that is how the pricing of spectrum table happens and it's very similar to uh, the aws athena service so if you are aware of athena it's the same pricing in athena as well you have uh, one tb of data extraction cost equals to five dollar which is similar to redshift spectrum okay uh, now i will have a small hands-on session but before we get into the hands-on uh let me check if there are any questions that we have from any of our users yes Rajas. so i think we have two questions uh sure go with the first one so first is around the distribution style with all mm -hmm. distribution style does the replication applicable with all the child tables associated with it got it okay so uh basically when you say child table like uh can we elaborate on what are the child tables? Are there join or are there primary key foreign key relations or something like that? Yeah, I think we are waiting for the post. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think meantime, let's take the second question. Sure. Uh, the second question is from Shri. I heard that Redshift serverless currently doesn't uh, let us delete is that still unavailable oh delete delete uh data from redshift uh ideally it should have the feature of deleting the data so um it's it, it it's going to have all the different sql queries and commands that you can fire on any data variable right it, it will allow you to uh create tables it will allow you to uh, load the data into those tables and of course delete update and uh query the data so uh, there is no change in the functioning or in the features of Redshift. It basically, it's giving you a serverless kind of a version of the entire Redshift cluster. So it's going to have all the delete update and other features which are present on a normal Redshift cluster. Got it. I think those were the two questions. I would request uh, Sai, uh, if you can elaborate what you sir. Yeah, Rajas, I think those were two questions. Let's move it. Okay, uh, sure. I think correct. I think the answer is correct. Foreign key constraint with okay. all the distribution. Got it. Okay, understood. So foreign key constraint in if you have a foreign key constraint between the, between those two tables, generally it won't replicate the other table because see, uh, these are two independent tables, right? So there is a table one. For, let's say for table one, you actually define all distributions time. Okay. So automatically the, the, co the copy of that table will be replicated in each and every node of the cluster. But for table two, it's not necessary that it will also be replicated because it will have its own distribution style that you define. So automatically it means that let's say if you, you are using a key distribution style, then it will be distributed in the key manner. So the foreign key relation table does not actually get replicated because otherwise then if you uh, think logically generally we have multiple relations across different tables in a warehouse right so if i if i use all distribution style for one table then it does not mean that all the other tables also become all distribution style every table will have its own distribution style and the relation is just a relation right so uh, you define that relation so that you can actually join tables between them so that is completely different and the distribution style are completely two different things I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Rajas. I think we can go ahead uh, with the demo. Sure. Yep. So let me switch to the S3 console. Yeah. So let's let's start with the um, spectrum table creation and uh, basically how do we create a data catalog and everything. Okay. But before before we actually uh, create the uh, data catalog. So as I mentioned that if you want to create a spectrum table, so you need to have a data on S3. Okay. So let me first, first show you what is that data. So this particular S3 bucket, which I've already created, and I already have a CSV file on S3, okay, which is nothing but a latitude, longitude, and a zip code mapping file. So let me show you the data for this particular CSV. We'll use a query with S3 option and run a small query. Okay. 
yeah so this is the data that we have okay so we have a latitude column we have a longitude column and this zip code column okay so this particular uh, coordinates geographical coordinates is associated with zip code that kind of data you are having in this particular csv okay now let's actually go and start with the creation of a data catalog table okay so for that we'll have to uh, go into the glue section so let me open glue aws glue Yeah. So this is the entire Glue console. And as before we actually create a catalog, okay, Glue data catalog, we need to create a Glue crawler. Okay. So uh, let me first uh, tell you what is a Glue crawler. So basically, whenever you create a crawler, a crawler's uh, functioning is to actually go to the source of the data and to extract the schema of that particular data. And that schema is something that goes into a Glue data catalog. So uh, what happens is that Let's let's create a crawler and I'll explain uh, the functioning of it in more detail. So let me create click on create crawler. Let's give a name for this. Let's click on next. Okay. Uh, we'll keep the configuration same over here. Here, if you see, you can select a data store. Okay, so uh, here you can have any data sources that you can connect with the crawler. So in our example, we are going ahead with S3. Okay, and then. This is the path that you have to provide. Where is that particular CSV located on S3? So let's click onto this bucket and let me show you the uh, CSV. Okay, so this is the CSV, right, which we just saw. So I'll select a subfolder before that particular CSV and click on select. So basically, this now becomes the part of my S3 location where my data is actually stored. Let's click on next. Uh, add another data store. No, we don't want to add any other data store. Uh, here, if you see, for the first time, if you are using a crawler, uh, you will have to create a new IAM role. Okay, and the creation of IAM role is very simple. You have to just give a random name over here. Okay, and it will automatically, whenever the crawler is created, the IAM role associated with that will be automatically created in the backend. You do not have to worry about. What are the policies in that IAM role and everything? Okay, so for the first time, you won't probably have an existing IAM role, so you'll have to give a name over here. But I already have an existing IAM role. I'm going to select that IAM role from here. Basically, the IAM role, if you check the permissions of this IAM role, it's going to have the access of S3 only. So as a crawler needs to go into the S3 location and crawl the data to get the metadata out of it, so it needs the permission to access that S3 bucket. So it's going to have the S3 access policy only. Okay, let's click on next. Then you can define the frequency of it. So currently we are going ahead with on demand. Okay, but you can define whether it's an hourly, daily, or weekly. Now uh, the example that I can give you for this is like uh, let's say if you have an S3 location where uh, your your end customer is loading the data continuously. Okay, and there are new files which are automatically created on S3. So if you want to keep keep your metadata information up to date. So you can define the frequency of that particular crawler to be hour, hourly or daily, okay, whatever suits your project requirements. So what happens is that every time the crawler runs, it will uh, extract the metadata. So it can be possible that new records are added, right? So whenever new records are added, it updates the data catalog in the glue itself. And it's necessary to have the updated data catalog because that is how your, uh, your uh, Redshift Spectrum table is going to design the query execution plan. So everything depends upon the metadata information of that table. So it's necessary that your metadata information should be updated. Now here we need to create a selected database. So let's add a database over here. I'll put a name of the database as RS lat along database. Okay. I'll give this database and click on create. Keep the other information as it is. And this is going to create the database directly. You can uh give different prefixes to your table names but uh, i'm not going to give any prefix uh click on to the next and this is where you can actually review all the configurations that you have for the crawler section okay and click on finish so this is going to create a crawler okay now let's run the crawler okay click on to this checkbox and run the crawler so now what is going to happen in the backend your crawler will actually go into the S3 location. Okay, so S3 location is this this particular S3 location. It is going to go into this S3 location 
it's going to understand what is the schema of this particular csv and the details of that metadata information will be automatically created into this glue data catalog okay so let this uh, crawler completely run it will take around a minute or so to complete this performance until that time i can show you the database so with this this is the database that we already created uh, while creating the crawler and if you go into the table section then you will have the table coming up over here so this will come up only once the crawler is successfully executed let's refresh this it will show you the table coming up And as I mentioned that crawlers can actually point to various other sources, right? So you can uh, have an RDS as a source or a MySQL database as a source. And uh, that is the power that a crawler has. Basically, it can crawl any of these sources and it can create a catalog information in your Glue data catalog. So automatically now your Glue data catalog becomes a, a centralized repository for all the database information which is present in your project. Now let's refresh this. If you see it's stopping and it says that table added one. So let's go back to the table section. And here, if you see the table is already there. Let me just show you what type of information the crawler extracts from the uh, CSV. So it will basically understand that it is a CSV type of a file. Okay. And if you see these kind of Apache, JAR, Hadoop libraries, it's basically using Hive itself. So as I mentioned, Glue data catalog is nothing but it's a hive meta store itself. Okay. So it's using those properties to read the data from S3. Then it basically shows you what are the delimiters in the file, number of records. And here, if you see, it will also provide you with the exact column names. Okay. So automatically the column names are populated because we already had a column header in the CSV. If it does not have a column header, then you might have to provide a column name over here. Okay but it's able to determine the data type of that particular column. So it's able to identify that latitude longitudes are double and the zip code is big. Okay. So this is how we actually created a glue data catalog uh, for our particular CSV. Okay. Now let's move on in the creation of an external table for the spectrum. So let's go to the Redshift console. So I already have a Redshift cluster running over here. Okay. And this cluster is the same cluster that I used in our previous session. So I'm actually continuing the example that we took in our previous hands-on session. So uh, let me just first show you an important thing that we'll have to update before we actually go and create the spectrum table. So if you go to the properties section for this particular cluster, you will have an IM role associated to this. Okay. So let's click onto this IAM role. Now, um, as we understood that if, if I go back to that architecture once again, okay. So if you see this particular section, your Redshift needs to have access to glue data catalog and your S3 bucket, right? Then only then it can actually extract the metadata from glue data catalog and extract the data from S3 bucket to query the spectrum tables, right? So it automatically means that now Redshift should have permissions to access Glue as well as S3. And that is something that we'll have to add in the IAM role associated to that Redshift cluster. So if you see, there is only S3 read only access. So let me just uh, add some more permissions to this. Okay. Attach some IAM role. So I'll add AWS Glue console access to this particular policy. Okay. Click onto this and attach this policy. Okay. And there is already S3 read only access uh, for this. Uh, there needs to be one more permission. I think I'll have to add that Redshift full access. Amazon Redshift. Yeah. Okay. Attach this policy as well so that we can actually use our uh, Redshift cluster along with the query editor version 2. Let me now go back to the Redshift cluster. Okay. And now we'll go back to 
R query editor version two. So here we have the uh, Redshift cluster already there. So let's connect to our cluster. So we have connected. Let's just see what are the different databases and tables which are already present. So let me show you the pre-existing tables. Okay. So there are two tables that are already there. And let me just show you the, the taxi rides table. So this is the table that we actually loaded in our previous session. Uh, from S3 using copy commands and everything. But let's see what is the data which is present in this table. So here, if you see, it basically shows all the uh, taxi ride details which are present in the New York City. Okay, So this data is specific to New York City and it shows uh, what is the pickup time, what is the drop-off time, then the pickup longitude latitude and drop-off longitude latitude Okay, and the trip duration information. So basically, if you see that it has the coordinates of the pickup location and it has coordinates of the drop off location, but it does not show you the zip code from where it actually picked up the passenger and when where it actually dropped off the passenger. So that is something that we want to get from that mapping file, which I just showcased you on that S3 location, right? So that's our aim. So um, let's start with the creation of the uh, external schema. So let me show you this query. Okay. So let me uncomment this. And this is how you actually create an external schema. So the command is create external schema. You give a name to that particular schema. So I have given RS glue schema uh, from data catalog uh, and database name. Okay. Now from data catalog means that it actually wants to point to the glue data catalog. And now which database it should point is something that the database that we already created. So this is the same database that we created in glue, right? RS lat long database. If you check over here, check the database for this table, it's RS lat long database, right? So we are pointing to this glue database, which we have, then we provide the IM rule and then we provide the region for it. Okay. Let me run this particular command. Okay. So the query is successful. Okay. It's able to create an external schema. Let's just refresh this particular uh, panel over here and then we'll see what, what is the change that we can actually have a look at. So let me go into the dev and here, if you see that there is a new schema that is added, that is RS glue schema. If you check the difference in the icon over here, right? So that is the difference that tells you that this, this public schema is a local schema to Redshift while this RS glue schema is an external schema. If you see that arrow, it shows that it's just a pointer to the glue data catalog. Okay. And when I say pointer, it actually means that it's a pointer, right? Because I did not create any tables in Redshift spectrum. Okay automatically the table is also obtained in this particular panel, right? How does that happen? Because we are just pointing to that database and automatically whichever tables which are present in that database, all I can query using this external schema. Now, uh, I'll give you an example. Let's say if I go back in the glue console and I created one more table in this particular database, then without even doing anything and without even querying this or running this command again, I can automatically see the second table as well over here. The reason is that that this particular thing is just a pointer to the glue schema and not it's actually a actual schema which is present in the Redshift cluster. Okay. So here now we already have this schema present. So it means that we have created an external schema. Let me show you the data. Let's see that whether we are able to query the uh, external table. Okay. Perfect. So now we are also able to query the uh, spectrum table. Okay. So that is, the, this is the query that is uh, basically happening or using the spectrum nodes in the backend, right? So when I write select star from uh, external schema and the table name, the query is actually executed on the spectrum nodes. Now what the spectrum nodes will do, it will first go to the glue data catalog. It will check the schema. It will check whether the schema is matching with the query that I've actually fired. If it's successful, then it runs without any error. And the second step is that it will go to that S3 location, extract the data, uh, perform the transformation that I've done in the query and automatically give you the output. So this is the process that happens in the backend whenever I query a spectrum table. Okay. Now let's do the most important thing that we wanted to do. Uh, I'll run this particular 
query. It's basically showing you. Let me just come at the top. Now. So here, if you see the query, what I'm doing is that I'm joining the taxi rides table, okay, with the uh, spectrum table uh, on the pickup latitude with the mapping file latitude, pickup longitude with the mapping file longitude. Similar to that, we are also doing a join on the uh, drop off latitude with mapping file latitude and drop off longitude with the mapping file longitude. So from here, I'm getting the pickup zip code. So LTP zip code is nothing but pickup zip code. And from here, I'm getting the drop off zip code. So basically now along with the geographic uh, uh, pointers, I'm also knowing like this is my pickup zip code and this is my drop off zip code. Now that's going to be an interesting thing when I'm going to actually visualize this entire data into any BI tool, right? So in generally in most of the BI tools, we generally need to have zip code level information and everything. So that is something that can be obtained from this particular mapping file. And here, if you see, I'm just creating a materialized view query. Query. So let me run this particular table. And once it's successful, the materialized view will be able to see it from this particular panel. Let's see. So the query is executed. Let me refresh this. And then if you go into the dev public schema, here you will see a view. Okay. And if you see there already the view is the one which we created trip NYC with zip. Okay. Let's now actually go and query this materialized view and see whether we are able to get, oh, I'm running the query again. Sorry. Let me comment it out and let's see whether we are able to actually query this materialized view. So if you see, I have the, uh, all the rights level information. I have the latitude longitude information along with the state pickup zip code and the drop off zip code. So that's the beauty of it right now. Uh, if you, if you think properly, let's say if this mapping file gets updated on S3. Okay. Now in that case, you do not even have to run the crawler again, or you do not have to actually create a schema again on Redshift automatically. When you run this particular query, uh, because whenever you run a spectrum query, your latest data will be extracted from S3 and the output will be given. So that's the beauty of it that you do not have to actually update the data, even if the CSV is changing in S3 bucket. So that is how your spectrum is very useful in any kind of architecture. So let's, let's go back to the, uh, to the deck once again, and let's continue with the further topics. So now I'm going to cover the two important features that we have on Redshift. Okay. The first one is concurrency scaling. So let's understand what is concurrency scaling. As the name suggests, it's going to be very easy to understand. But basically, uh, whenever you enable the concurrency scaling feature for the Redshift cluster, so what happens is that whenever there is an uh, extreme load on your Redshift cluster and there are huge number of queries which are currently in a waiting stage on Redshift, so automatically Amazon Redshift will determine that particular state of the Redshift cluster. And if you have enabled concurrency scaling, it will create a transient cluster in the backend. It will automatically create a transient cluster. And all the queries which are currently in the waiting state are redirected to the transient clusters. Okay. So if you see the architecture, this is my main cluster. And then these are the list or multiple different transient clusters which are created in the backend. And the caching layer is something that is leveraged by both the cluster simultaneously so that there is only single version of data that they have, as well as the data is fetched from the main cluster itself. So your transient clusters are only going to compute whatever the uh, query is actually performing, and it's going to take the data from the main cluster itself. So automatically now your load on the main, main cluster reduces because now most of the queries are executed by the transient cluster. And that's the, that's the entire thing of how does it work. Okay. So as I mentioned that whenever there are multiple queries present in a queue, so Redshift will understand that particular state and it will create some transient clusters in the backend and it will redirect those queries, which are present in the waiting state to those transient cluster, execute those clusters and give back the result back to your client applications. And once the load again comes back to its normal place, those transient clusters will be automatically deleted from the backend. So everything happens automatically and it's completely managed by AWS. You just need to enable the concurrency scaling feature on your Redshift. 
that's the that's the entire beauty of it okay and let me tell you one one interesting feature okay that aws actually provides you so actually amazon provides you with one hour of free concurrency scaling option that you can enable for your redshift cluster only if your redshift cluster is running for 24 hours so what does i mean by this is that let's say if your cluster is running for 24 hours then automatically it will provide you with one hour of free concurrency scaling that you can enable okay now let's see if you are if you are having a production cluster generally we have production production clusters which are continuously running for all the time okay so let's say if your cluster is running for entire month then you can actually get 30 hours of concurrency scaling for free and you can enable it at any point of time so you can use the entire 30 hours within a single day or you can use it across different weekends let's say if you have an idea like every weekend there is a huge uh, performance uh, optimization that needs to be done then in that case you can actually enable concurrency scaling only for that period of time and that will take care of your heavy load that is performing so that's a very important feature that aws provides you and we should ideally use such kind of features because because anyways if we are using the redshift cluster continuously for the entire month you get 20 30 hours of free concurrency scaling that you can enable okay now let me get into the details of the WLM. I'll cover this WLM very quickly. So what is WLM first of all? So workload management means that it will, it's a feature that Redshift provides you to actually manage the different downstream applications or your consumption layers who are consuming the data from Redshift. Okay. So Redshift is a data warehouse, right? So it's not necessary that there is going to be only a single BI tool that is going to consume data from Redshift. There are going to be different consumption application, right? There can be a BI tool, there can be a data science team, there can be different ETL pipelines who are loading data on Redshift and those kind of things happening. Okay. So it becomes necessary to actually manage that entire workload. So Redshift provides you with two types of WLM uh, queues. The first one is a manual WLM, as the name suggests that as a developer, you get the ability to configure the memory allocations and the concurrency limit for the queues. So what happens is that these are the two features that you can actually uh, configure by your own. So let's say, let me take an example. So uh, in the morning, your Redshift cluster is loaded with the ETL queries, right? Generally, we have your ETL pipelines running in the morning and loading the T minus one data onto Redshift. So if that's the use case, then you know that any in, in morning uh, for around four to five hours, uh, there are going to be heavy ETL queries. So for that particular time, what you can do is that you can assign around 60% of the memory allocation to the ETL queue while keeping the concurrency limit to around six to seven queries running at one particular time. Then let's say if you have two other queues, data science queue and BI tools, BI queue, then automatically only less amount of memory will be left for those queues. Now in the evening, your ETL is not there your major focus is on BI requirement. So automatically what you can do is that you can define the BI queue to get around 80% or 70% of the memory allocation with the maximum number of concurrency uh, limit given to that particular queue. And according to that, you can actually change it. And the second type which we have is auto WLM. Here, as the name suggests, AWS will manage your entire uh, memory allocations and the concurrency limit for your queues. You do not have to worry about it. And generally, uh, this is the default uh, queue that we generally have. So let's say if you're not aware of this feature and you create a Redshift cluster, then it's automatically an auto WLM in the backend. So that's the default WLM queue that you have in the backend. Here, what happens is that Amazon will monitor your Redshift queries. The, 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 the memory required for running a particular query and accordingly, it will adjust the memory allocations in the backend and the concurrency limit for the other queues which are present. So everything will be done by uh, the auto WLM queue. You do not have to worry about it. But then there is a question like which one to choose and when, okay? So generally, uh, there is a thumb rule that if you are properly aware of your entire uh, workload and you know that this is the pattern that happens in this particular day, this is the pattern that generally happens in the weekends, then you should always go ahead with manual WLM because this gives you an ability to actually prepare the Redshift cluster for those kind of scenarios in future, right? But if you're not aware of how my uh, consumption layers are going to 
behave in the number of complexity of the queries and everything, then you're generally going to go ahead with auto W. So that is how you can actually differentiate between them. Okay. Uh, so I also have a small walkthrough of the WLM and it's going to be a very small walkthrough. I'll cover it quickly in the interest of time. So here, if you see, there is a configuration section and here we have a workload management. So I'm not going to create different queues and everything, but I'm just going to show you the different uh, configurations options that we have in WLM. So if you see, there is a default redshift uh, parameter that is already there. So if you click onto this, this default is always going to be an automatic WLM. And what does it mean? So let's say uh, this automatic WLM means that the memory percentage and concurrency is automatically decided by the Redshift cluster and you does not have the ability to change it. Okay. So let me create a, a new uh, parameter group, best WLM. Okay. Just to showcase the what are the different options which are present. If I click onto this test WLM, and if you see, it's again going to be an automatic WLM because the default is auto WLM, but we can change it. But let me show you the different options which are available. So as it's an auto WLM, the memory percentage is auto as well as the concurrency is auto. Okay. And here there is an interesting thing. So there is a query query monitoring rule that you can actually add. Okay. Now, when I click onto this add custom rule, you can actually define the monitoring predicates. Okay. So let's say if you have a ETL queue, let me name it as ETL. Okay. This is an ETL queue. And if you want to monitor the queries, which are running in the ETL queue, and if I want to check on the query execution times, and I want to say like, if my query execution time for any of the ETL queue, uh, goes beyond a certain, certain threshold value, let's say, uh, it's in seconds. So I'll give you uh, three, six, zero, zero. Okay. So it, it, if it goes beyond three, six, zero, zero second, then what action I can perform? There is, there are three options that it gives you either. You can log that particular query. You can abort the query or you can change the priority. Okay. So let's say if you say that this particular query is executing for that much amount of time and it's consuming a huge amount of memory for this particular queue, then I want to abort the query completely. But if you feel that, no, this query is important then I'll change the query priority from normal. I'll select it to go it to highest. So automatically now this query has a highest priority. So more amount of uh, memory and uh, CPU will be assigned to that query so that the query executes faster. Okay. And as it is a auto WLM, so you cannot actually change this thing, but let me <coughs> switch to uh, manual WLM. So if I switch to manual WLM and save it, and if I click on edit now, now it gives me an option to actually define the memory percentage as well as the concurrency limit while the other options remains the same. So I can have a query monitoring rule for manual WLM as well. Only difference is that in auto, you cannot define the memory percentage and concurrency limit in manual. You can actually define it. So that way you can actually configure the auto WLM and manual WLM for your Redshift cluster. So, uh, I think with this, I have covered most of the topics that we had for this particular session. Let me, uh, check for any, any specific questions, which are there. Sanchit, are there any questions? Yeah, there is one question what we have. Can we extract data from XML file too for Redshift Spectrum? Exactly. Cool. It's, it's completely possible. So basically your crawlers are able to extract the data from XML, CSV, JSON, Parquet, uh, zip files, Excel files, and other, other things. And actually there are different configurations that you can actually do in a crawler. Okay. You can define your own classifier. So, um, in crawler, you can actually define your own classifier and in that classifier, you can define your custom rules. Uh, and that is where if you have a, let's say, if you have a custom delimiter for a particular file, you can actually define it in that particular classifier and use that classifier in your crawlers. But by default, XML files are also supported by crawler. So you can actually, uh, use your XML files on, uh, S3, run a crawler over it, 
and automatically the catalog will be created in glue and once the data catalog is created in glue then you can easily query it using redshift spectrum so there is no limitation in terms of redshift spectrum and glue data catalog if glue data catalog is able to extract the schema from your raw data then your spectrum table will be able to query the data so that's the important part cool thank you uh there is one more question what we have from jay uh this is around when should we use athena versus redshift spectrum what are the pros and cons of the same got it i think that's a very good question i actually wanted to cover that point in my session but uh looking at the time so i'll answer this question so basically uh, what what is the difference between redshift spectrum and athena that's a very common question that we generally hear from any of our customers so there is a very thin line of difference in terms of features in terms of capability it's the same right so in athena what happens uh, is that your data is there on s3 you run crawlers and create a data catalog and using athena queries you can query the data which is present on s3 and similar things you can do with spectrum also right so feature wise it's the same now application wise there is a different uh, there is a thin line of difference between them okay now um, i'll give you an example so Uh, generally in data warehouse we have historic data right and historic data generally has uh, data for 5 years 6 years and 7 years right so it's it's more than around 5 years only now generally in any data warehousing system uh, your your reports and your applications and your business intelligence tools are not going to refer to the data which is 5 years old generally it's not a very common thing or very frequent thing that will happen right Uh, maximum you will go up to 3 years of data in look back period right so if you have a data which is around 6 years uh, present in your redshift cluster then why do you need to store that uh, data which is 3 years old right because it's not going to be used very frequently so there is a concept of hot data and cold data so when we say hot data it's majorly the recent data that we have and cold data is the data which is around let's say for your use case you can define cold data to be 3 years beyond or 5 years beyond whatever suits your business use case so generally we do not store the cold data within your redshift because it's general it's it's using the memory space and it's using the cpu power and everything so what we do is that we unload that cold data back to s3 okay so when we when we unload that data back to s3 so you have your cold data sitting on s3 and you have your hot data sitting on redshift cluster now let's say in in once in a year you get a report from your customer where you actually have to use that 3 uh, years old data and you have to query that um, you have to query that basically uh, older data or cold data so instead of actually now loading the data back into redshift again to query the data you can create the spectrum tables just point those cold data and create a external schema on redshift and you can join your local table along with your Uh, external table and get those outputs and reports generated so that's the exact use case basically uh, spectrum gives you a capability of where your one leg is sitting in redshift data warehouse and one leg is sitting in data lake so it it gives you a option of creating a lake house right in lake house lake house we generally combine data lake and data warehouse where i can actually query data lake and warehouse both at the same time so that is something that enables uh, redshift spectrum to actually do it So that that's the exact difference between Athena and Redshift Spectrum. Cool. Uh, I think that's what we have. I would request everyone. Uh, I will urge everyone, please post your question in the chat if you have any. Uh, we'll have Rajas who answer the questions. So we'll take a break of a minute. So if you have any questions, post in the chat. If not, uh, then we'll move ahead with the quiz section.
I think we are good. So Rajesh, I would request you to please stay with us for a couple of more minutes. Uh, let sure. me change the topic to a quiz now. So let me uh, stop sharing your screen. Uh, let me take the control and let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Okay? Yep. Okay. Cool. So uh, I'll post the link in the chat. So this link, uh, this quiz is on the Kahoot. So I would request everyone, please. All the folks who are, who are looking forward to play, uh, please join to this link. And just to remind everyone, we'll have the AWS credits for the winners. So please do join on this link. The link is in the chat and we'll see on the screen. Once you log in into it, you will see the name on the screen. So we have Aniket who has joined us. Shri King. Anma is there, Vikas. We'll wait a couple of more minutes. I see a good number of people. Uh, that's really good. We'll have total in total, we'll have five questions. Outside Rajas and me, all I'll request everyone to please join the quiz. Rajas, you can also join, but you're not allowed to answer the questions. <laughs> so we'll wait for a couple of more minutes and then I'll lock the quiz and start with the answers. Start with the quiz part. Cool. So we, I see total 11 of participants on my screen. Uh, last a minute to go. If there is anyone who's still left out, please do register. Awesome. I think let me go ahead and start with the first question. So here we go with our quiz. This is Redshift session two. And here we have the first question on our screen. How is the cost incurred for Redshift spectrum queries? Depend on the length of query executed, depend on the size of the data. And uh, depend on the complexity or depend on the number of spectrum tables created. As we can see, there are five right answers what we have. And the right answer is depend on the size of the data fetch from the S3 buckets. So out of total participants, six answered it and five were able to answer the right. Let me see who are the winners here for this particular first question. So as we can see the list, Ram is on the first point. And then we have, this is just the first question. Let me pull up the second question. Just here we go. So second question is when you will use the all distribution style, when you have the table, when you have all the tables using joins, when you have tables which are not using joins, when you have the tables that are huge in size, when you have tables which are smaller in size. When you will use all distribution style, we have two, one. Here we go. We have nine answers for this one. And the right answer is, as Rajas also mentioned in his session, the right answer is when you have the smaller size of table. So let's see how the points table looks like. Again, we have five people who have answered it right. Okay. So we see a change here. 
in the first and the second position itself we see a change that's good let me bring up the second question how redshift serverless is different than the redshift cluster it's automatically creatables when you load the data it will scale automatically it will scale automatically when you have queries in the waiting for the state it will manually create the tables when you load the table or for redshift sub for serverless you incur the cost only for data and not for query execution so as we can see the right answer is it will be automatically scale when having queries in the waiting for the stage and there are only two right answers let's see who are how the points table looks like so as we can see the points table here again i would request everyone if you need to see the questions please look into the screen in the video you only will get screen to answer the questions on your end the question will be visible from my screen which is currently shared live so i'll go with the next question this is the question number 4 what are the different types of wlm available it's automatic and manual second is auto and memory third is auto a uh, manual and concurrent and fourth is none of this we already have four answers 8 seconds to go and 3 2 1 let's see who give the right answer so we have eight people who have answered it right i think everyone have listened this section pretty well or this was the last section that's why we have all the eight folks answering it right let's see the point tables okay so i think interesting changes on this points table that's good akilan is killing it so he is was able to answer all four right questions that's awesome here we go with our last question out of 5 so the last question is how does the redshift spectrum table leverage to get the schema of the data interesting schema on the redshift cluster glue crawler glue data catalog or public schema on the redshift cluster how does the redshift spectrum table leverage to get the schema of the data and we have eight answers let's see who is able to answer it right so it's glue data catalog and we have six right answers let me see the points table let's see who gets into the third position so we have tanmay again at the third position let's see who is shri on the second and let's expect who is on the first so we have akilan on the first congratulations guys and we have two runner ups which is ram and sam so we have totally have three winners akilan shri and tanay congratulations to everyone i would request everyone that please do join slack aws user group mumbai if you are not part of it or share your email id with me on linkedin i will ensure that you get your aws credits as soon as possible and i hope you like this particular quiz so that's from my end in terms of the quiz i'll take i'll stop sharing my quiz uh, screen and if you have any other questions from rajesh please put the questions in the chat and we'll be happy to answer them again i would remind all the winners tanmay shri and akilan please if you are part of user group mumbai slack channel dm me your email id there or dm me your email id on the linkedin i will ensure that you get the aws credits as soon as possible we'll take couple of more minutes if you have any other questions around redshift session wlm performance tuning any live example which you want to discuss with rajesh or me please put it in the chat before we wrap up the session thanks shri i hope you got good learning from this session and this was interesting again need not to worry if for all the folks who are watching this session in a recording form 
post your question in the comment form rajesh and i'll do in short post the session itself we'll answer all of your questions in the comments as well as you can reach out to me on linkedin as well as on the slack you can reach out to link uh, rajesh also he's also part of our ug mumbai slack channel and obviously linkedin you can easily reach out to him so that's what we have from this two wonderful sessions of redshift part 1 what we have done in may part 2 what we have done today i hope this was a good learning for the folks who don't even know about redshift so i would urge everyone please go through the first session as well as second and that's what we have i'll request everyone that hope you like the session so stay tuned please join our aws user group mumbai do subscribe follow us for such wonderful sessions and stay safe looking forward for your participants for tomorrow's session itself in the morning which is around the serverless series so that's what we have from this session i'll see you guys soon thank you